So now we would like to start the next session. Finally, um, the artificial intelligence of life art category. As I mentioned, this is the brand new category that it was born and started from 2019. So I would like to ask you all the panelists to sit here first. And I want to um, uh, pass the microphone to the Jens Hauser, who is the jury member of this, this category. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for attending this pre Ars Electronica forum dedicated to the award winners in the newly created category Artificial Intelligence and Life Arts. My name is Jens Hauser, I'm a Paris and Copenhagen based curator and researcher. And as one of the five jury members, of, I have the pleasure to welcome the winners of the two awards of distinction and of the Golden Nika. So, me and my jury fellows, Memo Acton, Vlad and Joler, Irini Papadimitriou and uh, Moon Ribas ended up with a potentially enigmatic title for our final statement. That may not sound self-evident, but hopefully after the presentations of our three prize winners becomes clearer. Life's intelligence, but beyond human cognition. When we gathered in April and started to review 840 entries received, we certainly did not doubt that we would conclude the competition by such a somehow humble, somewhere dystopic and ecological headline that avoids any kind of affirmative and hyperbolic claims with regards to the way that artistic practice deals with today's dominant technologies and its associated buzzwords. So establishing such a new category um, is a challenging task that requires an etymological and also an epistemological contextualization of the central key terms artificial intelligence and life art. But of all, it asks for the sensibility of how the oscillation between these two notions may correspond to criteria of artistic quality and criticality with regards to the currently much hyped notions that trigger unconventional responses in relation to the highly relevant impact on societies, ecologies, and relationships that humankind has with other living beings and planetary systems. So first, maybe some statistics, basic statistics, while apologizing that we can only present here the main three awarded winners in this session, while all the additional 12 honorary mentions likewise deserve our full attention and consideration, and altogether cover a very broad range of practices, only a part of which has been able to be actually displayed here in the actual exhibition. So we strongly recommend an in-depth study of the catalog as well to discover this broad range of practices. Also in the light of the future submissions to this category that we of course encourage. So then among the three main awards and the 12 honorary mentions, we have artists from 13 different countries, 55% of whom are female. I say this also because the competition between these 15 projects has been very tight, and the boundaries between the first three and the other 12 awards were very elastic, while on this panel here we have two out of three awardees from the same country, two of them are male artists, and we understand that there's a policy also of transparency at Ars Electronica intended with regards to gender and other balances. So this new category uh, replaces, and at first sight at least, seems to narrow down a bit the scope of the highly successful hybrid art category that has been in place 
since 2007. So in order to explain these developments, it's worth to have a very short look on the evolutionary patterns of the changing category schemes. And I remember very well when back in 2007, we tried to make sense of this then new hybrid art category. At this time, hybrid art was conceived as a place for works that did not qualify as interactive anymore. And to those that until then could not find a place in any existing category such as net art, digital music, or computer animation. So it was opening a space for today's, quote, hybrid transdisciplinary projects and approaches to media art. That was the definition at that time. However, a close etymological sense uh, reveals that the word hybrid, which is having its origin in biology, referred to being heterogeneous in origin or composition or the blending of traits. The first jury at this time felt deeply inspired by a paper published by Brian Stross, The Hybrid Metaphor, From Biology to Culture, arguing that biological and cultural hybridity to a large extent can be compared, especially with regards to a desired phenomenon of heterosis, also called hybrid vigor. So what breeders appreciate as increased vigor or higher capacity for growth, which is often displayed by hybrid animals or plants, increased growth rate, size, fertility, and so on, was also expected for hybrid vigor in cultural terms. But Strauss explained as well that the very notion of the hybrid is a total cult cultural construct and depends on what he calls a hybridity cycle. Hybrids, in the sense once enough of the same kinds are created, can be inbred to develop increasing homogeneity sufficient to be called purebreds again. And if hybrids are mated together, their vigor may decrease in succeeding generations. So interestingly, in 2007, there was some irony in that when it came down to nominate the golden Nika and the two distinctions, the jury quite unconsciously has been most seduced by projects in which the blending of traits was fulfilled within the realm of the etymological source of hybridity itself, meaning that we saw the hybrid vigor best expressed in art projects that had a relationships to biological systems and organic materiality as such. Over the years now, we could observe that the percentage of such works has been ever increasing, and that in a certain sense, the hybridity cycle was about to produce its effects. Since more and more, the two clusters, aliveness and intelligence of systems were getting dominant. In this light, we may understand Ars Electronica's desire to extend, to extract the surviving specimen and to feed them into another cycle while hybrid art became a subcategory of artificial intelligence and live art now. So the new category marks and sparks discussions about the links between the largely ambiguous notions of intelligence and aliveness as such. Addressing, on the other hand, machinic practices of the animation of the technological and also biological practices of the technologization of what is naturally animated. So it encourages artistic thought about whether the problematic notion of artificiality is just reserved to human action, hence expressing an anthropocentric position per se, and about how far innate technical capacities of non-human agents play a crucial role within a larger biosemiotic web of transspecies relationships that are often at the core of art projects proposing more humble attitudes instead of glorification of human prowess and progress. And we will see that we have some specimen of these art strategies here. Historically, then, the scope of artificial, uh, the artificially, artificial intelligence and life arts category can also be seen to embody dichotomic developments within the fields of artificial intelligence and artificial life research since the 1960s. So, in a nutshell, life versus mind, biological versus psychological, oscillating between cybernetic interest in self-organization, autonomy, adaptation and regulation, and symbolic and computational approaches with their focus on intelligence understood as information processing capacities, programming languages, machine learning, the modeling of human-like capacities and consciousness, or artificial neural networks. If such different approaches have been partially merged into areas such as soft or situated robotics, distributed cognition, and technological hybrids composed of analog digital and hard soft wet systems, the advent of such a new category becomes plausible. 
So while such technical and philosophical debates set the backs of the stage of the jury process, however, we foregrounded the search for critical artistic excellence without any desire to cover as many aspects as possible within the wide range of the category. We were less concerned with technical perfection than with critical reflection of hyperbolic in these affirmative mainstream discourses surrounding the fields. It may seem surprising that the jury detected generally less awareness, poetry and humor in art projects or devices mimicking human intelligence, such as GAN, generative adversarial networks or chats, than in unconventional and very personal artistic inquiries into ecosystemic forms of intelligence. So among the awarded projects, many demonstrate a high level of both critical and humorous system thinking, the quest for other than human intelligence, socially sustainable and peaceful use of artificial intelligence beyond militarizing fantasies, alternative sensory and perceptual modalities such as smell or taste, biosemiotic reflections on alternative agencies such as plants and bacteria, thoughts about the limits of technological bioremediation, material practices in the context of ecological and climate crisis, or hybrid installations combining, again, software, wetware, and, wet and hardware. So the first award of distinction we now want to have a closer look at can be characterized as a citizen science subversion of surveillance technology in order to deploy them for the greater good. So the project we frame by Adam Harway, an American artist and researcher based in Berlin, focuses on computer vision, privacy, and surveillance technology by combining art as activism, open source, and DIY, and do it with others, philosophies, and community building. Against the grain of the bulk of today's artificial intelligent technologies, so primarily surveillance technology fueled by business models of internet tech advertising companies and the military industrial complex, WeFrame is a collection of open source tools, workshops, documentation and other resources that reclaim these technologies and make them available for the benefit of human rights researchers and activists. Especially, this includes training states of the art object detection models to recognize illegal minutions and images and videos. So to overcome one of the toughest challenges involved with such a task, task being able to cope with the vast amount of possibilities that the system might encounter, Adam Harway works with the Syrian and Yemeni archives in order to produce synthetic data on which object recognition models can be trained on. So please welcome our first RWD, Adam Harway. Thank you for the nice introduction. Thank you for coming. And thank you for yeah, allowing me to be a part of Ars Electronica this year. The, the project that I've been working on, as Jens mentioned, is called the V-Frame, uh, which stands for Visual Forensics and Metadata Extraction. And the general themes are art and surveillance of the project. So what I will talk about more is this, which is the project on view here. Um, but to introduce where I'm coming from for the project, I'll talk very briefly about the work that I've done before that led me here. And now going back nine years to a project that breaks face detection by reverse engineering the face detection profiles and then converting that into a fashion style. And uh, what you see here happening is the difference between the kind of camouflage pattern working and the uncamouflaged face being very visible and exposed. And further exploring the ideas of camouflage against a kind of military surveillance, thermal uh, image that's being used on military drones, uh, recontextualizing that with a form of Islamic inspired dress to create what's called the anti-drone burqa. So these are quite a few years ago now, 
And then uh, a few years after that, creating one called the Hyperface uh, Scarf, which to use facial recognition decoys to confuse and overwhelm the uh, prioritization in the algorithm to choose the highest confidence face. Uh, after working on these for a few years, I think I came to a realization that there, is, uh, there are many ways to think about the surveillance problem, and counter surveillance is only one of those. And what I found is that all of this technology is becoming incredibly normalized, and there's something, though, quite unique about what's happening right now, is if you listen to people from think tanks, um, they'll tell you, uh, for example, CNAS, they'll tell you that the best artificial intelligence technology is not being developed in any super secret lab, it's being developed by the big tech companies, so Facebook, Google, um, and similar. And what's interesting about that is a lot of it is open source also, PyTorch and TensorFlow. Um, so what we have, from my perspective, is a surplus of uh, surveillance uh, capitalism uh, flowing into open source code repositories, uh, things that we can use to uh, reach other objectives. And that's kind of one of the motivations behind the project VFrame is to think about, well, there are all, there are all these tools and they come from the perspective of being able to analyze the world, to reduce and flatten the world into um, different types of data. But we don't have to use them to analyze consumers. Uh, in fact, it's quite interesting if you look at one computer vision toolkit called OpenVINO from Intel, um, it's forbidden to export that to countries including Syria, Sudan, and North Korea. But then if you look at how it's being used, it's made for analyzing shop, shoppers, consumers in retail space. So you see a real blending and blurring of what is considered military grade technology and what's being deployed in stores to analyze and track uh, consumers. I find that strange and problematic. So if it is military grade technology, why don't we use it in a militaristic way, but from a different perspective. So working with human rights groups. In this case, um, there are many places where conflicts are emerging around the world, and an increasing amount of visual evidence is being posted and shared online. But there is so much evidence that it's not possible for very small, often underfunded human rights groups to analyze all that. The problem is most of the data that you would use to train object detection is in the form of cats and dogs and bicycles or a lot of uh, data sets used for training um, algorithms for semi-autonomous cars. So the project that's on display here is thinking, okay, that's not going to cut it for looking for illegal munitions um, and there's a big gap between deploying these tools to um, human rights applications and what is actually out there available in open source already. And that gap is in data and training data because the way that artificial intelligence works as of now is that you program it with data. The algorithms are open source, but you can't use them unless you have data. Most of those data sets aren't ap applicable. So this project looks at rendering photorealistic data and to do that, I mean, just cut me off if I go over time here, but I'll um, show a quick case study. This is called the AO25 cluster munition. It was produced in the former Soviet Union and has now been exported and is used in Syria. It's quite a deadly munition because it doesn't, one, work always as expected. Um, two, it's deadly when it does work as expected. When it hits a softer ground, for example, dirt, uh, then it doesn't explode and leaves uh, the danger similar to landmines. So based on the existing photos of that appearing online, I uh, worked with my collaborator Josh Labouf to remodel it to scale, texture it, and then create 3D models. We did that for about five or six munitions now. So this is one example, and it's one of the more important ones to find because uh, these appear frequently in the Syrian archive. 
So then we use that same methodology. The example on the bottom left is the cargo munition from which the AO25 submunition appears. And then we replicate the scene based on the photos appearing online to match the dirt, color, um, plants, and background. Then it's a matter of scripting everything together to create what's called a synthetic data set. And I'll just show you what that looks like. In practice, then you have uh, capacity for virtually unlimited training data. Uh, most of the work comes in the form of 3D modeling and recreating the scenes. But then you just create what are called pixel masks and you use those to um, automatically mark those parts of the image. Otherwise, you would be stuck doing manual annotation, which in many cases is um, remoted out to uh, foreign um, yeah, annotation farms. And so this is also a much cleaner way of producing the training data. And we can uh, scale it up to many different types of munitions. The one you see here is called PTAB, which is an incendiary anti-artillery munition. So what that looks like when you put it into practice, uh, training purely on the synthetic data. So from, yeah, what's exciting from a programmer's standpoint is that it's literally two scripts, one to generate and then one to train. And uh, three or four days later, you're able to do this. And that's quite exciting because we are able to deploy that to scale for millions of videos that would otherwise be um, unable to comprehend uh, the amount of time required to look at a million videos is uh, superhuman. And when you do that with a computer vision, it takes a day. So now we can analyze the entire archive. And if we're looking for a new type of munition, uh, in some cases it's an indirect object, for example, a respirator that we would look for, or a sign, you saw the danger sign, that um, signals the possibility that a munition, illegal munition, may be near. So it, it um, yeah, greatly amplifies the capabilities of small human rights research teams. And as far as the, the project fitting into um, art, for me, I didn't jump into it as an art project, but I think it's possible that art can come out of things um, just by jumping into it and see what happens. So the items on display here are artifacts, are replicas, one-to-one uh, -one scale painted to look exactly like the munitions appearing in Syria and in Yemen. So that's, um, well, it's quite a um, complicated um, project in some ways, the, the politics of it. But it's, I think it's also uplifting because it's solving a problem and it's being uh, put directly into use. And to me, that's what's most exciting about the project uh, is that it doesn't create distance, it shortens the distance and um, getting to the material of the, the archive. So thanks to the funding partners and the researchers I work with, that's the project. I uh, hope the timing was okay. Thank you. So we agreed that we would take questions in the end and discuss all together what links these different projects together. So we are now coming to the second award of distinction and we have a very, very different definition of what intelligence might be and what artificial IT might be. In this project, Confronting Vegetal Otherness by Spila Petric and rest a few words. So Spila Petric is a Slovenian new media artist and former scientific researcher, also with a background in biology based in Ljubljana and Amsterdam. And their practice is a multi-species endeavor, a composite of natural science, wet media and performance. And what is on show here is just a part of the triptych that has been awarded. So the whole triptych called Confronting Vegetal Analysis is here just represented with one of the works that Spela is going to talk about. So this is triptych, the jury found that she demonstrates a continued and conceptually uh, work to address what I call biosemiotic relationship earlier with the plant world and to call for the enlarging of human sensorium via plant amorphization. And translating her long-term involvement with the plant kingdom, 
at different scales, both in time and space. Petrich has potentially staged human-plant kinship and co-performativity from the molecular to the ecological realm via different vectors of communication from hormones to light. So please welcome Spela Petrich. Hello. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, honor. Um, I would like to talk to you today about the project, the whole opus, and a bit of also the, the body, the meat around it. Um, and I'll just dig right in. So in the Western tradition of binaries, uh, the discourse on the other has been uh, very constitutional to what we are, you know, a way to point to our values, morality, ethics. However, on the other side, living is inherently chimeric. Uh, it's a chimera of capacities and genetic exchanges through time and bodies. So in a way, it's kind of a paradox that in our contemporary Western cosmology, these clear-cut boundaries are still favored, uh, and they paint a simple, manageable picture of reality. However, this oppositional stance, this us and them logic, crumbles. Thank you. Um, once the disregard for the other starts undermining the very foundation of our own existence, which I think we are all sort of experiencing. Critical animal studies uh, have been addressing some of the major issues of biopolitics and biopower exercised over animal life and taking into account the massive production of meat for human consumption. It very much deserves investigation and acknowledgement uh, of the various extensions of human activities and human politics onto animals. However, our connection to animals is innately quite strong, and when we stare into the eyes of a dog, we see ourselves, we feel kinship, so we experience shock, guilt, and disgust, knowing we allow our extended family to be so badly mistreated in animal farms. But our animal, uh, if our animal uh, treatment uh, paints a grim picture of us, our cruelty and, um, uh, sorry, 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 um, so our, Treatment of animals uh, paints a grim picture of us, our cruelty, and ironically what Agamben calls the animality of humans, a bare, uncultured, uncultivated life. But what should leave us even less at ease is our relationship with plants. You know? So this group of creatures is manipulated, modified, castrated, and misunderstood to an extent that animals are not. In contemporary biopolitics, it is plants rather than animals that are the objected, forgotten other, the living reduced to material, the barely living essential nourishment for the higher, better, more complex, more advanced outcomes of evolution. So as far as ethics are concerned, there is a practical reason for drawing the line. Uh, and to par paraphrase Kerry Wolf, if we start taking plants into ethical consideration, what will we be allowed to eat? Of course, this is a kind of a ironic question. But recently there has been a resurgence of interest in plant life. It's biology, physio physiology, um, as well as, oh, sorry, um, epistemology and ontology. But it isn't really enough to make just an appendix to our current system of values. We really need to reconsider um, plant life in a different way than a modified copy-paste of human and, human and animal ethics. So what is needed is a deeper understanding of plant principles which can influence our philosophical view on plant life as to construct a new metaphysics and a new ontology of plants uh, that can also serve as a basis of more inclusive ethics. But do not feel guilty in case you suffer from plant blindness. You know, the attitude is woven deep into our worldview 
and uh, there we can find the biological reasons for their mar marginalization at least according to the criteria of Western philosophy. So uh, we know that plants are not autonomous, which is valued, but rather heteronomous, uh, so very dependent on the environment. They are not individual, uh, but more individual. They don't have an interiority. They hardly have anything that is essential. Uh, and of course, uh, they don't move a lot, and uh, they're perceived as generally uh, completely passive. Even though this is not true, that is how, uh, and not fully true, in comparison to animals, uh, this can be sort of stated. So plants embody everything metaphysics has deemed improper. This is a statement by Michael Martyr. So hence, our rejection, reification of them is what comes naturally. The challenge then is to figure out an alternative yardstick which, with which we can measure plant life if we must or maybe not measure it at all. Maybe it's just uh, simply the challenge to love the alien. And uh, from my experience, this is a mature kind of love, a love that is not based on fascination or infatuation, but a gentle observation, an awareness of the ways we are undone by each other and constructed anew, how we succumb to the materiality and ephemerality of each encounter and how we intercognate uh, to in turn mold each other. And in this process, I think that we are also looking at being human anew. As technology and new flavors of capitalist economy transform our societies, our being in society, uh, we need to equip ourselves with new vantage points and epistems that reflect this contemporary condition. When plants are our kin and they manifest a being in the world uh, which could perhaps help us understand some of what is most unnerving and frightening in our existence uh, from radical ecosystem transitions to also surveillance capitalism, which was already mentioned before. So the opus Confronting Vegetal Otherness uh, was an opus created in search of the ways through which uh, the eye-opening discourse on plants by authors such as Michael Marder, Matthew Hall, Jeffrey Nealon, Monica Galliano, and Monica Bacche could be reflected in affect, experience, and substance. So what uh, do we do with all this wonderful theory? But simon simultaneously, based on the methods I chose, it was also an investigation of the capacities of um, and um, of the techno-scientific framework um, to deconstruct the hierarchies on which it was built. So in a way, the question, can we uh, perhaps dismantle the master's, to uh, master's castle using the master's tools? This was a question. Um, so I was initially inspired, like Jens mentioned, uh, by the concept of biosemiotics, which reads relations between entities uh, through the process of meaning making, uh, because it allows to understand the semiotic freedom, the capacity to make sense of uh, a new sense of science as a universal property of not only humans or certain privileged life forms, but also as one of the basic organizing principles exhibited in already in very simple molecular systems. So it invites actually an observation of this interspecies culture, not only as an artistic speculation, but rather it's just drawing attention to something, to a phenomenon that was always already there. Uh, because I realized that the effect of scales will significantly define uh, the encounters um, that we, we have and we perceive after all our sensorium is, uh, has access only to this mesoscale, uh, which also Jens uh, talks about. Um, the, all the other scales are heavily mediated and therefore add a particular flavor of, for, of the interpretation and the affects uh, that go along with them. So the first, first project in the series was called uh, Scotopoiesis, and it was devoted to the mundane experience of people as individuals. Scotopoiesis means uh, shaped by darkness, and uh, during this performance, I committed my body to stillness for 20 hours while I was casting a shadow onto germinating crests. And I understood it as a process of intercognition uh, where I would see the crest, um, it would become sort of an object in my um, perceptual milieu, but the same would also happen in the crest's um, 
sensorium, I would become the object of the Cress's perception. Since it is se uh, sensing the shadow and adapting its morphology to try to grow into the light. So uh, this was uh, me standing there and the crest. Uh, but at the end of our collective effort, there was an imprint of my silhouette onto the crest, and this was a proof of my extended presence. And on the other hand, while it was growing tall, I was contracting slightly um, because of, of just the, the gravity, um, the compression of the spine. Um, and, and so the process, I would argue, is uh, one of semiosis. My shadow was an index signaling the crest to attempt to avoid it, um, much like it would try to grow from underneath uh, the foliage of a larger plant. Uh, and therefore, this intercognition was truly in the space of the authentic. The Strange Encounters uh, uh, was actually a micro-performance under the lens of a microscope. Um, it was uh, an encounter between a human and a plant, human and plant cells. Um, in the deconstruction of plant-human relationship, in this case, the search for modes of human existence that could be perceived as equivalent to plant life. And because of bio biotechnologies, uh, my biotechnologies alienating molecularization of living entities maintained in defined media and sterile plastic containers. Um, we can really understand human as material under the situation. So uh, we can think of human uh, in terms afforded to plants. And much like algae are increasingly employed in the production of biomass and pharmaceuticals, so too are human cells and culture becoming an essential component of our body maintenance program. They can be coaxed uh, into the form and function of a multiplicity of organs transplanted in pig, into pig embryos genetically modified to eliminate diseases and selected for particular applications. So as cells in culture, we are fragmented, decentered, decentralized, outsourced, bettered, molded, molded viscerally spread over and viscerally spread over large areas. On the other hand, I had chlorella, which is the slightly green algae uh, that represented plants, and chlorella is a single-celled photosynthetic algae populating a, ver a variety of ecological niches. Um, and the cancer is a disease, but it also represents an actualization of the emancipatory potential of entities within the ecosystem of the body. So much like the single-celled algae, it is a pre-specialized assemblage of cells and, and, and an expression of the reproductive potential of a metastable cellular unit, allocating all available resources to indefinite multiplication. It's the industrially productive form of mammalian cells, the raw material for research uh, and vaccine, um, for research into vaccine and antibody production. So uh, in this case, uh, we had a meeting of two negative affinities. However, the only comments uh, that I got in terms of rejecting what a plant and what a human is, is on the human side. In the end, uh, you would be happy to know that, I guess, that the algae is um, the one that survived the longest. So finally, and I will conclude quickly, uh, the project Phytotertology, which is here on display, I dove even deeper into the molecular, and I tried to procreate plant human monsters by navigating the realm of abstract sex. Uh, I would become the other mother uh, to plants through a process of infonutritive becoming that is actually only understood through a schemata of scientific narratives and experienced as a very alien form of care. So the phytopollutants, uh, as I named them, are half-breads uh, that grow as embryos outside their natural wombs, which would be the seeds, in a process of ectogenesis akin to bringing to term babies in incubators. So in this construction of uh, plant parenthood, uh, my, my steroid hormones, uh, which I extracted from the urine, were the volatile fraction presenting the objective a human molecular capacity to converse with plants. 
because this was based on a scientific discovery that hormones um, that are structurally identical to mammalian ones also appear in plants. So these hormones, including progesterone, testosterone, and estrogen, are thought to have roles in plant sexual reproduction, growth, and development. Uh, so against genetics as the key organizing principle of life, I was interested in molecular nurture and a somewhat subtler ephemeral uh, coming together with a weedy plant called the Thalecress, uh, or in professional circles, known as Arabidopsis thaliana. It's a model organism of plant genetics and development. So uh, with a fairly simple biotechnological protocol and some micromanual skills, I was able to coax into existence from a single somatic cells, uh, cell plant embryos, which were then bathed uh, in steroids from my urine. And with this process, my molecules were speaking uh, to them about my presence, in response to which they altered their epigenetic patterns and grew a unique body morphology. So these tiny monsters that came into being from an impossible love uh, with intense labor and yearning of plant parenthood, um, emerged as beings of permeability and harbingers of effective intra-action. Yet, the Thalecrest and myself were in the embrace not only of each other, but also succumbing to the reductive power of molecular engineering. Like us, you see, the phytopollutants are beings of biotechnological excess, so it's scientific epistemology that invites the expansion of biopolitics through the erasure of any significant difference between living bodies and technology. So regardless of the care and affection, the techno-scientific framework imposes the gaze of control, molecularization, and the necessity of technology to keep the plant monsters alive and to maintain our relationship. So the relationship between, in this case, plants and humans, myself and uh, the tail crest, is precarized and in the struggle to perform the operations of the scientific methodology, both partners are reduced uh, and subjected to the rules of the interface. So phytopollutants, for me, are the monsters uh, that actually stand at the threshold of our biotechnological becoming. And I see them as an alter ego, as a projection of an other self that paradoxically, through the molecular assemblage, states there is no significant difference between the biotechnological manipulation of plant and human matter. So strangely, for me, confronting vegetal otherness led to the realization that not only have plants never been human, but that in many ways we are all already plants. Thank you. I think we have, we shouldn't say we have a lot of flesh for discussion, but maybe a lot of chloroplasts for discussion afterwards. So we'll probably have a kind of discussion about what decentralized intelligence means to everybody on this panel. So it's probably also the scope of interest of Paul Van Oos, uh, who's an artist and professor of art at the University at Buffalo, New York, where he's also the funding director of the Coalesce Center for Biological Arts. And he's not an unknown person here, of course. We know him overall throughout the history for two or three projects where he is dealing with deconstructing the genetic primacy in creating identity. And there's a different kind of deconstruction of identity in the work that is on display here and that is labor, which has been awarded the golden NICA to this bio-cybernetic and olfactive installation. And this installation, the jury felt, was elegantly combining reflections about the automation of labor as such, the obsession with optimization in the name of capital, current challenges posed by today's microbiome research, the gut-brain access, for example, to the notion of human individuality as such, and also the progressive disappearance of work and workers as we know it. 
And in times of, at the one hand, of algorithmic finance and high frequency trading, this fully functioning life labor ratory produces the sweaty smell of labor, not as a byproduct, but as an end product, involving three bioreactors containing three different strains of bacteria that collaborate to create scents typically associated with human exertion. And the nostalgic link between physical human effort and economic value is therefore disrupted in this very, very amazing work while stressing the disintegration of personhood. So we have here uh, this kind of instrumentalization of sequential micro gestures on the industrial production line that is continued in a dynamic self-regulation art installation to embody our society's shift from human and machine labor to increasingly pervasive forms of microbial manufacturing and computerized bio-optimization. At the same time, this smell of labor that Paul is producing here by microbes um, and that are populating human host bodies and outly outnumbering human cells, as we know, accentuates also biophilosophical questions about what defines and determines humanness in times where research into the, grand the gut brain axis reveals cognitive and emotional dependencies from our microbial co actors. And please welcome Paul Vanus and his bacteria. Oh, good, you're showing the picture of me and not my screen, I'm glad. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, uh, first of all, uh, thanks a lot to uh, the, the, the jury uh, this, this year for, for recognizing this piece. I, I, um, it's probably been one of the longest projects I've ever worked on. It's uh, about a six year uh, project from beginning to end. and. Um, uh, <clears throat> what I thought I'd do here is kind of just really just talk through, just explain the project, and then kind of as we get closer to the end, I'll kind of sort of expand sort of on more of the kind of philosophical dimensions uh, as we go. Uh, I, uh, again, I, you know, I've been working uh, with, you know, techno science, I suppose. Um, interestingly enough, I, I began working in the early 90s with uh, AI-based um, artworks, and um, by the late 90s, I began working in um, uh, biotechnological uh, practices. Uh, so it's kind of, it's also nice to be recognized in this category because I feel like it's also kind of encompassed sort of a, my own my own my own work in this period. Um, so I guess what's also interesting is that um, uh, two years ago I was here and uh, Yuri uh, uh, from the jury uh, said, "Boy, you know, uh, this is interesting work, Paul. But you've been working with these DNA projects now for 15 years. Is there something <laughs> that's coming next?" And I said, "You know, yeah. Listen, I promise there's this new piece coming, and I'm working really, really hard. So I'm glad to have this piece here. Um, basically, uh, so I, I think of uh, the, the past work I've done for the past 15 years um, uh, as taking on uh, a lot of the misleading metaphors and hype." surrounding DNA and the Human Genome Project. Um, and I've been taking this on on many fronts, um, uh, particularly like this critique of like this overly reductive worldview um, of, 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 of genomics and genetics, right? Um, uh, so for instance, you know, uh, for me, a lot of the most problematic hype uh, was you know the um, misleading metaphors surrounding it, such as you know the idea of DNA as a as a book of life, uh, DNA fingerprinting, um, and most problematically this idea of like DNA as destiny. Uh, uh, all these metaphors um, are fatalistic, uh, uh, and I guess so. I guess the, for me the it was it was the problem of both of they're 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 incredibly kind of fatalistic determinism. Uh, the DNA is somehow, you know, the ultimate authority, you know, this idea of the truth machine. Uh, 
and that was all that really matters, right? And this is also, I mean, I think this work really also kind of paralleled a certain kind of, a, a different societal moment for the kind of place of genomics as well, like a place in which uh, I can remember going to uh, the Museum of Science when I first got to Buffalo in 1999, and that, uh, I was asking about one of the DNA exhibits, and the, uh, the docent at the, at the Museum of Science said, well, yeah, in fact, your DNA is so important that it is going to control which foot you step off with uh, when you leave, when you, when you take your next step, you know? Uh, so, you know, the, the dogma was so incredibly complete. So, uh, so then for 20 years, I've been trying to complicate, you know, uh, the fixity, the wholeness, the essence, uh, and determinism um, in favor of dynamic change, in, in favor of hybridity, in favor of multiplicity, uh, uncertainty. Uh, but uh, I was also, you know, undermining the kind of informalization of life um, in the context of genomics, uh, which, again, it kind of reached its apex about uh, at, at the turn of the millennium. And now we're seeing something a little different. Um, so uh, if, um, if my DNA work was reacting against the idea of DNA it's fully denoting who we are, what we will be, our strengths and weaknesses, our genetic destiny. Uh, I just thought this was a gross oversimplification of the complexity of life. Um, and certainly, I, I think many people have talked about this since 2007 uh, it was the first uh, kind of moments where, where the these new ideas were reaching the public. Uh, in 2007, um, with the publication of um, uh, a, a number of articles, this is a, a popular um, article in The Independent, but it's also the basis of um, research that was really going on since 2005. So since this time, um, human identity has become increasingly complicated in, in a refreshing way. Uh, research into the human biome uh, at this time found that um, human uh, bacterial cells outnumbered uh, human cells uh, 10 to 1 in and around the body. Um, that uh, number has been uh, much, that estimate has been much reduced since then, but still this, this fact that, that on and around the body uh, our cell, uh, human cells are outnumbered by, by bacterial ones. And I guess there's also, for me, with that finding even more fascinating, was also that um, the amount of variance uh, uh, in these cells that, that um, the, um, uh, the research was finding that uh, we had uh, approximately 70% difference in the bacteria, the species, at, like the bacteria, our, our bacteria, bacterial taxa uh, differed by as much as 70% uh, with people uh, that would be in the same room with us. So this was radical, again, you know, undermining uh, you know, all this kind of crap that we've been hit with um, with DNA for years. Uh, so again, and I also thought this was interesting, and, and, I, and I, as I, as I wrote, I said, in this context, the idea of what exactly makes up a person was again under the microscope, not just for scientists, but for the culture at large. For centuries, we, we've been debating who gets to be considered a person and when, a question that dominates political discourse of the last few centuries because of the connection to labor and liberation in the post-Renaissance world, and, and how do we define human beings now? And this is where I, this is where this, this new work began. And so I thought it was interesting, you know, to further dethrone any kind of sense of uh, of self or innateness. Um, you know, most people think, you know, their smell is, you know, their smell. You know, uh, some kind of, you know, thing coming from their very kind of depths, uh, you know, depths of personhood. Or, or individualhood, but um, it, it's, it's kind of much more complex than that. And it turns out that it's a whole cocktail of microorganisms that live in and on, uh, both on the inside and on the outside of our bodies that are basically metabolizing our sweat, which give it its scent, right? Um, uh, scent itself is, is scentless, um, and it's only the microbial um, interactions which are, which are actually causing causing our scent. And uh, so there are actually like uh, basically three different bacteria that are, are responsible for, for the scent of our sweat, Sweet three different genera of bacteria. Uh, one is Staphylococcus. Um, uh, Staphylococcus um, tends to metabolize skin secretions into compounds uh, like isovaleric acid. It produces a fairly mild scent and it's associated with um, both apocrine and eccrine sweat glands. It also turns out that, that there's really, uh, not only are there three, three types of bacteria uh, 
on our bodies at which metabolize sweat, but there's, they tend to also populate different sweat glands. So that we have eccrine glands, which basically diffuse heat and are the ways in which the body uh, re re reduces, um, yeah, I guess basically ventilates itself. And interestingly enough, um, in terms of this, what it means to be human, humans and horses are the only real animals that, that sweat. Most other animals uh, diffuse their heat through their, through their mouth or other means. But anyways, there's three, three different bacteria, Staphylococcus epidermigus, uh, Propiangi bacteria, which tends to live mostly inside the skin. It produces, I think, the funkiest, cheesiest, vinegariest, acriest, acrid ogres that we have. Uh, I, uh, my, my research into this really began with papers from the 1970s in the, with the cheese industry. Uh, Propiangi bacteria is also responsible for the little holes in Swiss cheese um, and many of the kind of deeper, sort of more complex textures of cheese. Uh, to, uh, olfactorily. Uh, and then lastly, there was a species called Corneum bacteria that was kind of most magical of all in some ways because it could kind of do everything that the others did, except there are so many different choices it had about how to make those smells. Um, so yeah, so the, 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 the scent of sweat is literally the scent of these bacteria. Uh, it's not really a human scent unless we, of course, are completely willing to redefine uh, what constitutes a human. Uh, and I thought um, in, in terms of um, maybe uh, picking up a little bit on what Spello was talking about, uh, there's been interesting scholarship on this, I think, uh, work of Elizabeth Gross and Rosie Bredaghi and also Monica Baca uh, sought to recast humans uh, as a more kind of structural role that privileges metabolic processes or flows rather than the organism. Um, Elizabeth Gross points out that force precedes the subjects and this needs to be understood in its full subhuman and superhuman resonance as in the inhuman, which both makes a human possible and at the same time positions a human in a world where force works in spite of and around the human, within and as the human. So in this sense, you know, the, the, the human could be envisioned uh, more like a tube um, through which things pass through. Um, this whole notion of what is inside and what is outside becomes much more complex. We were speaking about this last night, uh, and typically we think everything that happens from here on is within us, but in fact, if we think about us as not having, uh, as having two different outsides in a sense, the space, uh, the, the space uh, of digestion as not necessarily being a uh, human space. Uh, anyways, I thought th what was also intriguing about this was that um, post-humanist structures, uh, scholars like, especially from AI, uh, have sought to um, uh, de describe the informatic revolution um, in these radical terms. So like they'll say like, for instance, that like the first big revolution was the, was the Copernican revolution, which showed that, that man was no longer at the center of the universe, right? This de-centers man from his centeredness. And then secondly, you have um, you know, the Darwinian revolution, which showed that you know, uh, mankind is not really so separate from the animals and plants and other critters in the world. Again, kind of dethroning our sense of specialness. And then third, you have the Freudian revolution, which showed that uh, uh, <clears throat> in fact, uh, humans were not even in fact rational. That our behavior uh, that we'd been thinking we were modern and rational it, it, it came from much more primitive and kind of unknowable um, uh, other um, impulses. Uh, and then finally, the informatic revolution would posit that, you know, um, in fact, you know, we are, it's, it's the relationship of machines which further uh, kind of uh, reduces our specialness. But, uh, but for me, I wind up thinking, no, and it, it really much more profound was this, um, was, was the findings of the microbiome that say that, you know, no, in fact, not only um, are we not at the center of the universe? Not only are we not distinct from other animals, but in fact, we are kind of made up of all these different animals. And it, it brings up all kinds of different issues. You know, are we truly uh, a symbiotic organism or are we merely kind of a, more of a kind of composite organism? Um, so, and then on another front with this piece, I was fascinated by the fact that since industrialization, the factory model is changing. Uh, it was changing from human labor to machine labor and increasingly in the 21st century to microbial manufacturing. And that microbial life was today producing uh, tons of our products, our food stocks, our, our drinks, our... Uh, building materials. Uh, and what was particularly fascinating is that these microorganisms themselves were often the end products 
In other cases, um, their respiration was producing products, and sometimes they're harvested for their components, such as genetic sequences, um, antibodies, and proteins. These things literally live to work. Um, and this was this kind of very you know, Foucauldian sense, um, this sort of the deepening of the, ex of the exploitation of life and living processes. The design, the engineering, the management, and the commodification literally of life itself from birth to death. Um, so then the, the intent of this project was to paradoxically then produce the scent of this human sweat as uh, not as a byproduct but as an end product, right? Uh, not as uh, superfluous waste uh, but as, uh, as, as end product goal. Um, and the idea was to make a generative living process as an art installation that would fill the gallery of the scent of human uh, exertion but with no humans present. Uh, so the process began basically by by harvesting my um, harvesting uh, the um, uh, my own skin bacteria. Um, this began actually in uh, uh, Alto University at, at, at Biophilia. Uh, I began harvesting and collecting this, um, which um, uh, and uh, finally um, finally basically plating these bacteria and um, and identifying them. And um, basically then, uh, once they were identified, I spent, spent some time trying to concoct these nutrient mixtures that would contain sufficient amounts of required fats and sugars uh, while not having too much scent of their own. Um, so uh, it turns out that one of the things that was working my advantage was that sweat, uh, sorry, these bacteria could handle a lot of um, salt in their mixtures so that I could actually um, uh, keep other things from growing by just having incredibly high amounts of salt in their nutrient mix. Um, yeah, so then again, labor project was, was, was trying to recreate the scent of people exerting themselves without people. Um, each bioreactor then would incubate a unique species of human skin bacteria responsible for these primary scents of sweat. Uh, again, that's Staphylococcus epidermidis, Cornubacterium xeroses, and Propionum bacteria avidum. Um, and as these um, bacteria metabolize the nutrient broth, they create these distinct smells of human ex exertion, stress, and anxiety. Uh, their scents were designed to combine in the central chamber. Uh, and the idea of the central chamber was that it had this, um, basically, the, uh, the sweatshop icon, the, the, the vacant white t-shirt. And it was kind of, again, kind of doubly signifying. It was both the object that one would make in a sweatshop uh, but it was also the object that workers had traditionally sweat within. Uh, so in this case, I wanted to have this kind of vacant shirt to again kind of point to the kind of vacantness of, um, you know, the, la the lack of a human body uh, in this creation. Uh, I, the, the other thing, uh, kind of a subtler thing, was that I, I wanted to have this be able to run in batch mode. So when you like make beer and things like this, you often run uh, or sorry, not in batch mode, but in continuous mode. A beer is produced in batch mode, like you kind of fill a big fermenter, you let it ferment, you take it out, you bottle it, and then you start a new one. I, I really felt like in the Foucauldian sense that, that, that this should be a continuous process, that organisms should grow, they should live, they should die. Again, their production was, um, th their, their, their lives were, um, were, were the point, right? Um, they were the product. Product and produce, in this case, would be absolutely conflated. And, and for that sense, it felt like it needed to be able to run in perpetuity for as long as there was media and as long as I could con continue to throw out the end product, it should keep running in, in continuous mode. Um, <clears throat> the last thing I wanted to talk about with this is, is that there's also these, uh, on the walls, there's these um, sweat-stained, um, these, these what I call sweat stain transfer prints. Um, and they're, um, they're like an, what I call a novel analog documentation method. Um, these, these also kind of connect back, I think, to my interest you know, in the fingerprint and the, you know, the idea that there's, there's, there's parts of our body that we know exist, but they are not highlighted. And they're these simple kind of technological process which cause these to um, kind of show up um, uh, with full intensity. Uh, so these, um, these were originally created, um, these uh, in the Buffalo um, exhibition, which, which was in February. Uh, in this case, I paid uh, three different university students to do whatever type of work they wanted. I'd give them $50 to do whatever they wanted, provided they could return me 
a moist t-shirt. Uh, so they went out, and uh, uh, the, which was a prevailing wage, I thought. Uh, so w what these things do is they, they chronicle this like incredibly like visceral temporal moment, this like unconscious performative action. Uh, the way I do it is, um, and this was from the, when I first uh, attempted this, which was at Cultivamos Cultura in, in Portugal. Basically, I, people do labor. I take the t-shirts that they've sweat in, I shake them up with charcoal, and I put them between two boards, basically, and run over that with an SUV. And what comes out, then, are these kind of incredible, again, kind of like these like unintentional um, performances, right? This kind of incredibly like visceral moment. These very things that usually we hide becomes, incre becomes you know, incredibly visible. So the prints weren't really prints of shirts. They were prints of intimate exertion, right? The t-shirt becomes almost kind of a ghost. And all that's left, again, is this process, which is uh, somewhat invisible and is very temporal. Um, so in the end, then, uh, my, uh, my goals of this were that labor should be apprehended differently than other artworks. Um, the primary um, register for the perception should be olfactory. And their, and their sense shouldn't uh, respond to their uh, particular um, expected milieu. Uh, and that. Um, and that we ponder as we look at this, you know, these, these clues like um, the idea of life, you know, inseparable from labor, product and produce conflated, the idea of biology is increasingly a, a subfield of technology, and finally at this kind of metaphorical sense, the idea of man omitted from manufacturing, right? Me deep in all our uh, many of our languages, this idea of mono or man, uh, it, it's part of manufacturing. It becomes seen as being very much our essence. And this idea I was trying to get to is also this new type of labor, which completely, you know, uh, uh, man is kind of triply omitted. Uh, I, I made the project, um, uh, I'll just end in like one minute, I think, right? Um, I, I, I was lucky uh, to make the project um, at a lab that I built uh, at, at, at the University of Buffalo called Coalesce. Coalesce came about um, in the most unlikely fashion. I submitted a bid uh, that everybody at the university was submitting to uh, kind of have a pet project. And I presented this, uh, I, I kind of struggled with about 100 biologists who were put into the same group. We were all in the same room. And we had to make a kind of a pitch to these um, uh, business people and uh, engineering types. And I thought I didn't have a chance in hell. Uh, and it turned out that um, uh, when the final reports were written by this external committee, they said that, in fact, this, was, uh, this could be the center of an of a entire community of excellence. And so uh, Coalesce was born about five years ago. So this has actually been uh, the, the place where I've been able to, to do this work. I, I basically built a lab specifically tailored to, um, uh, to cultivating microbes. And, and one of the things that's intriguing is like when you build a lab like this in, in an institution, it, uh, it, I, would have, I would have assumed that there were dozens of labs that did what I did, that like were places where you could culture bacteria and all kinds of different um, aerobic and anaerobic environments. And I, I realized I was wrong that, that most of this new microbiomics involved identifying organisms, right? It was, the money was to be made in the, in the genomic part, basically like sucking out the DNA from these things and uh, attempting to kind of define what they were uh, or attempting to kind of sneak genes out uh, for other purposes. But very few people really knew that much about how it is to kind of make these non-model organisms live. Uh, and Maybe this would be my final point in, in this, is, is that um, this labor is, is still um, somewhat, um, I think, unusual in terms of the kind of microbial work that's happening um, both in universities and um, industries and, um, and in the art world where uh, the synthetic biology approach has become kind of a default. Uh, in this case, I was like, once I started working with these bacteria, I realized that like, I was committed to the idea that um, I wanted to understand the organism in its environment. I didn't just want to like kind of grab some genes out of it that might be responsible for creating certain uh, metabolic pathways and then putting them into some kind of other kind of like workhorse cell. I was interested in actually learning how, yeah, how they functioned, how they lived, and tried to reproduce those those uh, very 
various situations in the tank. So uh, if you're really geeking out on this piece and you look down at the bottom, you'll see that like the Staphylococcus make these kind of strange, wispy, gauzy threads, which, which every time the motors turn will kind of like weave around the tanks. Whereas the Propiani are these kind of gray sand-like, they create these sand-like um, deposits on the bottom, and they try to live on the bottom because they prefer not to have any air. And, la and the corny bacteria are like these kind of dusty brown things which kind of start to collect and build up and, and, and tend to leave the solution cloudy. So um, uh, with, with, with that being said, this is a, there's a piece in a way that's... Um, uh, <clears throat> It's looking at the industrial production of, uh, and, and this kind of new commodification of life. But at the same time, I'm also, um, I'm also critical of the way that biology has become technobiology, that, that, um, that, that the sciences have become increasingly kind of caught up in becoming products uh, and, and patentable techniques rather than a kind of a space where we actually are kind of coming to understand organisms. And thanks. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thank all three of you for your fascinating insight. So I think we have uh, kind of 15 minutes to discuss, debate, and take some questions. I would like to maybe start with something because it might not be obvious what are the connections then on that panel because the category spreads out so widely. <laughs> but there are probably be some links, and let's just start with the naming of life arts and artificial intelligence, because I don't know, if you go back to Nelson Goodman's statement that map making is world making, the part of the map is also the way that we name things in a coordinate system in relationship to senses that we are most familiar with, like audio, vision, and so on in our cases, to actually fit the coordinate system, which is still a little bit Cartesian, which is favored by vision. <laughs> but when we name something intelligence, be it artificial, when we name something aliveness, so we're dealing here with an area which in which we are trapped by on a kind of enhanced uh, cognitivism on one side and on a kind of neo-vitalism on the other, which is embedded by the two key terms here. So how do we actually encounter these works which all in a certain way deconstruct the notions but also the certainty that intelligence is only reserved to human beings and that this, all the works that we have been showing are deconstructing modalities of sensing on the one hand and scales of sensing. Right? So in Adam's case it's very much about the macroscopic uh, decentralization of vision in order to, to take machine vision and at a larger scale. And you have been dealing with other modes of perception which is olfactory, which is hormonal and so on. So how can we fit even the terms of intelligence and aliveness in there while we have neural, neural networks that become uh, capable of simulating life-like simulations and actions. And on the one hand, we have uh, not so well understood mechanisms of microbial life, which also have some kind of intelligence. And in Spela space, I mean, plant intelligence is also such a buzzword, such as plant neurophysiology, where sometimes people get up to the, and jump up to say, you cannot just uh, perceive this, or proceed with this anthropocentrism. Why should it be neuro? Yeah, like the neural networks. So I would like to ask a first question to all of you and how far you feel that your actual practice is challenging and shifting the notions of what you personally understand as intelligence and what is artificial then in this intelligence. Maybe you can start to have a <laughs> improvised answer. Well, first I feel like my project needs more bacteria to... <laughs> Um, represent this category well. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's uh, uh, maybe a difficult question for me because um, I'm approaching it so much in a functional way and thinking maybe beside the term that artificial intelligence has become such a loaded and hyped up word that, uh, well, what I'm really trying to do is to 
I guess, automate perceptual labor of looking at things. And well, there is, um, it's artificial and it's, um, I guess the intelligence is that I work with a team of uh, researchers who are very knowledgeable in what's happening in Yemen and Syria and Sudan and uh, work with them to encode that knowledge into an algorithm. So it's a very specific kind of intelligence that they've gathered uh, through their own experience and through their network of researchers that we then figure out a way to uh, transcode into an algorithm um, so that it can be automated. And it's mostly, in their case, a kind of perceptual intelligence. But it's also overcoming I mean, the limitations of what the mesoscopic bubble of single human vision brain uh, a brain person that is individual is not capable of doing, while the challenges are more macroscopic, ecological, social, political. I mean, the aim is just to go beyond this kind of level, as also Spela referred to as the limitations of this mesoscopic plane, right? Would you agree? Yeah, I would say to be an effective researcher now, you need to think in a, in a much more augmented, amplified way to limit yourself to only your own um, perceptual track is, uh, well, is uh, going to limit what you can, how effective you can be in pursuing legal cases with evidence. So as a, as a human, there's sort of pressure to become greater, to um, join yourself with this technology to be able to be effective at what you want to do. Spera, is um, intelligence needed in your definition of biosemantic exchange, where even non-symbolically functioning an organism may have the capacities not to just to inform but to interpret? It? I mean, is consciousness needed for intelligence? And how far do you see that there is a kind of decentralized intelligence? I mean, we have had this discussion a lot in the 70s with Gibson's ecological approaches to decentralized cognition in dolphins and birds and so on, that is not all brain-centered and so on. And you take it a step further to plant intelligence. Do you talk about plant intelligence? So I, I, I don't really care much about the term because I think the term itself is imbued with so much presupposition about what it should be. So I'm not even, it's not a focus um, of my work at all. And even um, now when, when I'm actually in the next series of works addressing um, artificial intelligence specifically, uh, I like to uh, avoid the term and not be concerned about these definitions. So actually for me, the way to approach um, what you would call the intelligence of plants is to not try to find it and just sort of ob observe um, the, the interactions, the effects. And um, most importantly, uh, by not uh, looking for it, you are kind of accepting that it's already there in, in a way. So that's, that's um, what my approach would be. So in short, um, your biosemantic understanding would be that life makes sense? Um, yes, yes. And maybe even superstructures that would, you wouldn't even call life. Hmm? I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe making sense is an accident. So, Paul, is intelligence important? I mean, there's a paradox in your work in somehow that you have a total control, a mechanical, computerized control of something which is then actually uh, staged to, uh, uh, to create uh, uncertainty and a discourse of uncertainty. How do you deal with this paradox? Well, maybe, um, let me, I, maybe I think one of the things I first have to, think, have to bring up is I... It, it came up a little bit in the last panel as well um, on the music panel that there's a there's there's a different sense of AI that that when we talk about sort of corporate AI and when we talk about hacker AI and um, and I think backtracking from that I think sometimes there's a different kind of AI when we talk about AI as kind of corporate product and we talk about AI as um, computer science 
And so my introduction to AI in the 90s always had to do not so much with creating something that was really intelligent or did things or necessarily was a machine, was a tool, but it was more of a way of asking questions. And it was a way of kind of proposing kind of um, uh, processes that, you know, it was a, it was a way of, um, in some sense, the strong AI people like, you know, Marvin Minsky's and Herb Simons and these types were trying to model, you know, the way that neuron, neurons were working. And I was a little less interested in that, but there was also people trying to model, you know, of behavior and political systems. There was, this, there was a program out called Politics by a guy named Jamie Carmenel, which could model uh, the thinking of a Barry Goldwater conservative. Um, where you could feed any kind of text and it would kind of pick out these things. And these weren't really about being products. They were about kind of trying to uncover something deep about what is intelligence, what is, uh, what's the basis for, for behavior. And I think at this level is where there's really interesting parallels, I think, with, again, kind of a, a more pure science in the sense of uh, science that's trying to actually kind of understand something about um, and not necessarily just to um, uh, necessarily kind of uh, make productive organisms. And so I, this is where I think that the, the interesting kind of connections between these fields are and also where this kind of like search for kind of an understanding of what seems intelligent and search for understanding of things that seem alive kind of come together in, a, in, a, in an intriguing way. I hope that's not taking the question in too much the wrong way. <laughs> you mentioned the dichotomy, the, the dualism yourself. You say against this kind of notion of synthetic biology, totally controlled yeah. biology, very often much uh, following the rules of what uh, computer scientists call orthogonality. Yeah. Right? And on the other side, you refer to a I mean, field that is uh, much related to microbial research, which is directed uh, evolution, to say that how much can I change the medium and not to change the core of the cell, not change the genome, but actually to experiment, let the organism evolve as it was, and to change the conditions, but not the organism. So there's different approaches. Yeah, so, so I mean, classically, the synthetic biology approach would be, you know, take a gene from an, for, from an organism that does something that you want, stick it, you know, basically, you know, put it into an organism that's easier to grow and can be more easily, more easily controlled, have it produce that, that end product, you know, it's, it's very, it's like a, it's, it's a it's an engineering diagram, right? And um, what's interesting about when you work with things actually like in something like their own environment, even if it's in vitro, uh, and with these organisms, you realize, well, okay, I'm trying to make this thing produce them, this one uh, uh, acid, isovaleric acid, or some kind of a strange fatty acid or something. Uh, you realize, in fact, these things have sometimes 20 different metabolic routes that they can take. It's not just like an engineering diagram. It's a whole complex organism that, for instance, like we think about humans, we have Krebs cycles, we have plants, they have, you know, uh, photosynthesis. Uh, bacteria actually have like dozens of different options like this for how to kind of live and, met and metabolize. And so it was such, when I realized that, you know, the incredible way in which, in, in which the kind of synthetic biology, you know, the, the genetic engineering approach dumbs down uh, cells as to like, you know, put this in, get this out, simple inputs and outputs. This is absolutely like, a, it's, it's, it's a, the, the per level of perversity is incredibly strange with, with bacteria that have so many more options even than humans in terms of how we, how they process things. I mean, in your work, Adam, it's also very much related to in how far you combine the importance of the actual material, three-dimensional obwork in the real world, because that is what you're after. I mean, the aim is also an activist, a pragmatic one, to find these munitions. So in how far do you deal with this, what Paul said, as a kind of level of abstraction that helps at a certain point, but the very importance of the, even the material modeling, because it's amazing when you see the sculptures, I mean, you can think of them as sculptures as well, the three-dimensional objects, and how far do they impact on how the deep learning mechanisms that you're working with are uh, functioning or not functioning? Um, originally, I printed the sculptures as a way to connect with the project. And what I realize is these are now an important next step of the project. Um, but it is helpful for people to connect with it. Uh, so the first thing is to generate an object detection algorithm trained on the synthetic data. Uh, the next thing that we're working on is to create these uh, sculptures and to create another data set with people using them. 
Uh, so the lighting conditions will change, and there are some things that are easier to 3D model and some things that are more difficult. So the sculptures are now becoming uh, data generation objects in themselves. Uh, we can put them into scenes, and now I look for places, location scout, to find locations that are similar to where the objects would appear, and then stage scenes. So this is the next um, evolution of the project. Um, I think we have maybe two questions, or time for two questions from the audience. If you have any urgent or pressing questions, this is the moment. I think we have still three minutes to go. Is there anybody who wants to ask a question to our prize winners? Um, this is a question to Adam Harvey. And I want to ask you, um, with your research and your um, detecting of landmines, were you ever approached by military or did you get messages or were you, could you just be by yourself and do this? Yeah, so far it's been okay. I haven't been approached by anyone that I wouldn't want to be approached by. But there's, um, there are some lines that I want to cross and there are some military groups that are doing the same thing. It doesn't make sense to not uh, bridge the gap between them. So I started reaching out to um, groups that are doing similar work, for example, Bellingcat or Forensic Architecture, you may know, uh, Air Wars, Omega Research. And there's an um, increasing trend for more people to um, you know, take a citizen science approach or citizen journalist approach to looking at things that are appearing online and to uh, pursue figuring out if this c can contribute towards a possible legal case to help uh, bring justice. And in some cases that overlaps directly. Um, I, for most people you don't want to work with the military and certainly I don't work with the military. Um, but there is, uh, you know, shouldn't continue to demonize, in some cases, the justice work that's coming out of that is exactly the same. Uh, it's just important to ally yourself with the right group. For example, um, the campaign to stop killer robots actually overlaps quite a bit with the project, as does other groups based in Geneva, like Stop uh, Cluster Munitions. Uh, they're documenting all of this, and so the work that I do is open source, I publish it, and the trained detection models can then be used by anyone. So the important thing about the project for me is that instead of creating these, what I think are unjust ways of looking at the world through being monitored as a consumer in an unescapable network of surveillance in a smart city, that these detectors are trained specifically for one purpose to locate uh, munitions that everyone agrees are illegal. So to me, it's about, you know, what's really important about training that neural network, that object detection model, is that it encodes a different way of seeing. And it encodes, to me, a more just way of seeing. So whoever else wants to see the world that way, that's fine with me. Thank you. Is there another question in the, the audience? Do you want to conclude by anything? I don't know. <laughs> Greetings to your, your mother, your grandmother, I don't know. <laughs> so I will conclude the panel. Thanks for attending and just appreciate the works maybe differently with this insight given by the three panelists now. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for this um, session and thank you very much for the panelists. Thank you for the audiences and just organization um, information. As I informed before the panel, uh, no, no, more before the panel. Today there is the AI music festival in the Sankt Florian Stift, which is the monastery. And the bus is coming, uh, is uh, departing um, from 2.15 from very um,
close to here, so from, so to speak, from Oka Center, our info trainer and me is guiding to you. If you go to the Zang Florian, let's take this um, bus. Uh, the first bus, there are two buses. The first bus departure 215, and the next one is the 245. Please follow us. There's a four winners from the music category that, ah, no, two winners, sorry. The Shojiki's performance will be 330, the Tomomi Adachi's performance will be 630 at the Sankt, uh, Sankt Florian. And when you come back to the Oka Center, the Peta Kutin's work, uh, the performance will be in the Oka deck, 10 p.m., and the Patrick Lechner's work as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>